So that video we played last year at this time, Focus Forward 2020. Remix! <laughs> we had all these grand plans, all these grand things, and obviously the whole world has gone through something and we're still going through something. If you don't know what a remix is, it's usually a song that's just redone. And a song that usually has a new beat, um, some new characters in it, and it's usually just taking an old song and kind of revamping it. So today we're gonna call uh, uh, this session kind of the remix session of last year. Again, let's just admit, last year, sucked and we're not done we're not done but one thing i like to say is and i've been saying it this whole year is that there's always like a training ground god is always taking us somewhere and there's a training ground that's why we have practice if you're in sports um, is because you're practicing for the game you're practicing for uh the big show and so again this this message is for people who have been going to zoo town if you're new with us that's great because this is where we're going but really the thing is, is how is our church going to shine? How do we shine as the light of Christ in this next season? Because I know that the Lord has placed on my heart, something's coming. Something's coming. It's here. And it's coming. And again, I unapologet unapologetically say that God has raised myself up and my family and the leaders of this church for such a time as now. For such a time as now. Last year, we heard this term that I hate. I hate this term, essential worker. Who's essential, who's not? That's elitist crap. That's nonsense. And so what we're doing, we live in a society where we're constantly saying we want everybody to be equal and all we do is segregate. All we do is create systems to where people are actually different and people actually stand out. And that word essential worker was like the word of the year. And Christ on the cross said, you all are essential. My blood covered all of you. I died for the best of you, for the worst of you. You are all essential. And I say that because let me just say that the church is essential. What we're doing is essential. Jesus proved it. Jesus proved it. On the cross, he called us the bride of Christ. He said, church is essential. I wouldn't be doing this on the cross if I didn't think the body of Christ was essential. And so again, how are we going to shine? And the difference is, is you realize that the church was never supposed to, wasn't even supposed to exist. It was never going to exist because the whole world was gonna be the church. It says in the Garden of Eden, he says, be fruitful and multiply. We were never, I'm reading this great book right now called The Unseen Realm. And he talks about how the garden was just the epicenter of worship. It was the epicenter of humanity. And they were meant to be fruitful and multiply and go out and take over the whole world for the kingdom of God. Well, remix, we sinned. And it sent us down this crazy dark path. And so the church was invented by God to remix, to resurrect the entire world as the kingdom of God. Church is essential. It is essential. And now because we have you know, everything going on and there's so much fear, I love that term now, they call it fear porn, right? Every news article, everything is fear, 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 fear. We've had a whole year of trying to decide what's essential and what's not. I wanna show you today that you are essential, that church is essential, and what Zootown has in store in this new season is essential. Now let me say this, there's a season for everything. There's a season in everything. There's a season in churches. There's a season in preachers. There's a season in life. And we've been taking these, really these last four years and we've just been talking about the Father, the Father and grace and grace. And we're gonna continue to do that over and over and over. The main message of Zootown Church is the love of God for humanity and his forgiveness of sins. That is the main message. But there's a lot more in this book too. There's a lot more to cover. And so may I say this, that we are going into a new season of Zootown Church. We're going to a new season of what we're going to be talking about because the Lord has spoken to me and the staff that the world is going through a new season. If you don't think that 2020 is a spiritual battle, you're not seeing it. This is a spiritual battle. The Apostle Paul says our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's not about you and me being enemies or other, whoever politician, whatever it is, whatever country, not being enemies. It's about a spiritual battle that's been going on. And so we are going into a new season. But let me say this. Everyone is so triggered, so offended, and so on edge. It's going to be hard. 
So we're gonna pray for our hearts real quick because I'm coming in hot today. I really feel bad for you today. I'm just telling you, you're gonna do your best. God bless you. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I pray for our hearts. We live in a world that is telling us to constantly be offended, to constantly be upset, to constantly give our voice. It's a time to listen to your spirit. I pray for a level of humility in this room and I pray for a new spirit. I know you're gonna deliver a new spirit in the house of God. Let our hearts be listening. I block out any negative thing that's trying to get people to not hear this message in Jesus' name. Oh, man. Again, a song is a remix. A remix song is usually a blend of things. And so today's message is called, Roll Away the Stone, Grab Some New Wine, and Help a Brother Out. Roll away a stone, grab some new wine, and help a brother out. So we're gonna take three different passages in the Bible that the Lord has directed me in and where our church is going and where you play a part in that. So first we're gonna look at this scene where Jesus' homies died. His name was Lazarus. Jesus had friends. When God became flesh, it says he became our friend. Do you know that? God is your friend through Jesus Christ. That's an amazing reality. He's our brother, he's our savior, he's our God, and he's our friend. It says he, <laughs> he was accused of being friends with tax collectors and sinners. You like you hear me say it, I say it all the time. I hope I'm accused of the same. When the religious people are angry on who we're hanging out with or who we accept or who we show grace to, I think we're on the right path. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So he had this family where there was Mar Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They believed that this family was rich. They were wealthy. Right there, that should shut down a lot of what society's telling you that rich people are evil and rich people are bad. These were his friends. They hung out with him and they believed that this family funded his ministry. Now we know Judas had his fingers in the honey pot. But this family was crucial, but it says he was his friend. And he finds out Lazarus is dead. And so he gets word. He's not in the same town. So he gets word that his friend Lazarus is dead. And it says this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That's extremely important that the scriptures point that out. There is no lost word in scripture and the way it's phrased. Because then it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Any guy in here, if your wife says, hey, I need your help, and you say, I'll be there in two days, how's that going to go? Don't worry, honey, I'll be there in two days. You're going to be here now, right? Because that's love. We're supposed to serve and support our spouses, and so Jesus here says, oh man, I love them. I love those people. I'll see you in two days. What the Spirit is trying to make a point here is too, is that God's timing, but also that no disruption in your life, no bad times, 2020, as awful as it was, does not devalue God's love for you. No sin that you have right now, no thing that you're going through, no screw up of something you said never takes God's love from you. You were accepted at Calvary on the cross. But what these times do also show, and I said this in my Christmas Eve service, is it also shows, do we depend on his love? There's so many things we can depend on. And this year, there were so many things that got stripped out of the way. And so this is a line in the sand is are we going to depend on his love, his grace, his mercy every single day? And do we believe that he's going to finish the job? Do we believe that this year was doing something in us? So bad times and hard times and 2020 does not devalue God's love for us. He's not mad at us, right? Because, you know, a lot of people think that God punishes this side, but not the Christians, right? Well, he's not punishing anybody. It was a virus, it was a virus. We all were affected by it, okay? It has nothing to do with his love. If you've come to this church for a while, you've, you've heard me say this, and, and now I'm kind of on the other side of it, but, you know, I had, we, Jenny and I, had two hard babies. Colicky, bunch of surgeries, didn't sleep, night terrors. I kid you not, I did not get a full week, my wife and I didn't get a full week of sleep for seven years, for seven years, a full week. It was awful, it was so hard. I mean, how many nights was I in the garage angry at God? Why would you do this? Heal my kid, this and that, all those things. It was an, an important time in my life. God, do you even love us? You've called us to lead this ministry. Why is not everything going rainbows and unicorns right now? 
And again, there's this gospel in America that seems to tell you that if you come to Christ and you give your money, you're going to have prosperity, you're going to be blessed, and everything's going to go well. I'm sorry, that's not the gospel. It's not. So we go through this. But on the other side, now my wife and I can both see what it did. That was hard times as it brought our family together real close. We love spending time together. And the most wonderful thing is our kids love spending time with us. It brought us close. Our main goal, me and Jenny's main goal is when we're older that our kids love to hang out with us. They love to go on vacation with us. I bet if we pay, they'll go. I don't mind bribing them, all right? But we have this rule. We got this rule that as long as my kids are alive, they will not pay for a meal if I'm there. I don't care if I'm 150 years old. They'd be like... 120, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Someone will be feeding us at that point, <laughs> right? So it brought those hard times, brought us close together. It united us. So just because there's hard times, just because 2020, you need to know right now, it has not devalued his love for you. But it is an opportunity. We do have free will. We do have a choice. I look at the apostles, the stuff they went through. What makes me sad, and I'm going to touch on this at the end of my sermon, is that we can read these guys who were crucified upside down, burned at the stake, boiled alive, and we get upset over a tweet. What happened? And I'm talking about Christians, okay? And so we got these guys who paved the way for us, clear as day in the scriptures. These guys were amazing. Men and women were martyred for their faith. But everything was an opportunity because they had a higher way of thinking. Look what Paul says when he wrote uh, to the Philippians while he was in prison. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Fear. Fear controls us. People use fear to control other people and it works and you're watching it in 2020 and 2021. But look what he says there. He's like, yeah, I went to prison. I didn't do nothing wrong, but I just spread the gospel through the whole guards and government. Many government officials started following the church because of Paul's imprisonment. But I'll notice it also says that many people were more bold in their faith because they're like, man, if Paul is doing that and going against the grain and speaking the gospel while in chains, then we should be doing it while we're free. I pray, I know that through all this fear and all this like tension and everything, we need to get more bold. And I don't mean being a jerk, and I don't mean holding a sign on the corner, damning everybody to hell. I mean bold in the good news and the grace of Jesus Christ. And my goal as this pastor, as I'm stepping into this new season, is I'm done listening to the haters, and I'm going to be bold, and I hope you see my boldness shows you can be bold for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are we we so concerned what people think all the time? Why are we so concerned if we're offending somebody on some things, right? Right? This is our goal, is to be more bold, but guess what? In the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. This year, Zootown Church is going to be laser-focused. Laser-focused. Be ready. Be ready. So throughout this sermon, we're going to pause and we're going to pray. Because this message, is it can help you, but it's the Spirit of God that does it. It's the grace of Jesus. So pray with me. Lord, give us a spirit of boldness in 2021 and beyond. Let us drown out any voice or anything that's keeping us as a people of God from fulfilling your mission. Let us support those who are being condemned. Let us support those who are going through hard times, but let us be bolder and bolder with the spirit of God in the gospel of Jesus, amen. So Jesus finally goes after two days and on his way, Martha runs out and meets him. And you can sense that they're a little disappointed in Jesus. Like, look, man, We sent you a text. You didn't come. Where were you? And it says, Jesus said to her, chill out, girl. Your brother will rise again. That's how I hear Jesus say that. He probably didn't. But Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last days. Did she hear him? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies. So he never, he's like, yeah, you're going to die. 
Yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, here's the most important part. Do you believe this? Not to some dude on the internet believe it. Not to some other guy believe it. Do you believe this? But I want you to notice what she did. And this is where I'm just kind of laying out the vision of Zootown Church. Did you notice what she did when Jesus said, your brother will rise again? I mean, it was, I, I, I don't think he can make that any clearer, okay? This is what's going to happen, my dear. Your brother's gonna rise again. And what she did is she tried to use her knowledge of the scriptures and her theology to talk Jesus out of something he planned to do. She tried to use her wisdom. She tried to prove something to Jesus, like this has to be a trick, so I'm gonna quote the Bible. I'm gonna quote the Bible. And she missed that Jesus had a new thing for her. He had a new thing. He was speaking to her directly. And so oftentimes we have to get rid of this. I think the Bible is the inspired book of God. But Jesus is in 2021, friends, and he's speaking to you in this room in your situation. He's talking to you. And he has this new thing for her. See, I think what she heard him say, like a lot of Christians hear him say, is if, if, if you don't get this right, if you don't say the right thing, if you don't pray the right prayer, if you don't have the right theology, then I'm just not gonna move. That is not what he said. He says, the person of Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This is a new thing. This is a new existence. This is a new word from God. So sometimes we're holding on to these things in the past and we think, we think that if we, and this is something in Christianity that we're gonna break down at Zootown Church. There's this fear in Christians that if you don't get the perfect theology and you know everything about this book right, then God's gonna burn you. Jesus saves you, friends, not your perfect theology. Jesus saves you. Now let me say this, theology is incredibly important. It just means the study of God. That's what it means. It's incredibly important. It's understanding God. And this year at Zootown Church, we're gonna keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. This last three years, we've gone deeper. And some people, it just kind of riled them up because there's this weird thing in Christianity again that has people so afraid. Theology should be exciting. It should be fun. So this year, we're gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper. In the spring, I'm gonna do a series on hell, a four-week series on hell. Because every one of you got questions about hell and it's almost like we can't ask those questions. I'm gonna show the three different views of hell throughout history. We're gonna get into it. And you know what really matters is, do you believe in the resurrection of life right here, right now in this room? So we're gonna go deeper and not in fear. We're gonna go deeper, we're gonna go deeper, we're gonna go deeper. But here's the issue. Again, I try... <laughs> I really try not to talk bad now about another preacher or anything like that because I am a preacher and I know it's hard. It's just hard. You're always critiqued, all kinds of stuff. But there's a lot of these guys like John MacArthur and John Piper and some of them, they, it's like their whole mission and their whole message is to show who's right and who's wrong. They're doing messages on this is a true believer. This is a true man of God. This is a true this. And what they're really saying is we're right and they're wrong. And what it does is it's caused a huge fear in people. What Zootown Church is about is studying theology so we can know God better, but it's so we can sense the presence of Jesus. So we can have Jesus in our life and understand Jesus better. Listen to what Jesus said to a group of religious people who thought their theology saved them. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This is going to be something that might irk somebody's the wrong way, but hear what I'm saying. Some people worship the Bible. They worship the book, not the author. Because you can control it, you can touch it, you can study it, and then you can put it up and do whatever you want. We're not here to worship the book. We're here to worship the author. And it takes a sense of humility that does this. And what happens is when everything becomes about theology, you get a savior complex. Like you're trying to save it, like everyone from their false stuff. Not only that, is it makes you feel superior to people. Like you're right and they're wrong and you're better than them. We're not about that. 
We are about studying theology, but also grace. So let me give you an example. Jesus Christ walked with his disciples seven days a week, and they heard every sermon he ever gave, and they still screwed it up. They still screwed it up. They still didn't get it. How many times did Jesus say, I'm gonna be crucified, I'm gonna rise on the third day? And they're like, yeah. And then when it happened, they're like, let's run. And then when he shows up, they're like, I won't even believe it if I touch his side or touch his hand. These were his apostles. So grace, this takes grace and time. So we're gonna show each other grace and time as we study some of these deep things, but we're not going to divide over minor stuff. So here's the thing, theology is great. I think she was right on in trying to like prove her theology, Martha was. But he's like, I'm the person of the resurrection and life. So let me be clear, if you're reading your Bible, you should. Some of you need to read your Bible more. But if your theology isn't changing you, it's worthless. If your theology is making you more angry, more bitter, more upset, more judgmental, more divisive, you need a new theology, okay, friends? But if studying this is making you more grace-filled and seeing God in a bigger lens and being more grounded in truth, then you're on the right path. So let me just say this. Your theology is worthless if you aren't being more grace-filled and more passionate. But it's also worthless if you're not going against the grain of what the world is pushing. One of my favorite sayings, Malcolm Muggridge, only dead fish go downstream. I'm gonna say that again. Only dead fish go downstream. We are to be going against the grain, but everyone's so worried about it. everyone offended and everyone this and not having friends and all that and not being, not being called intelligent. That's such a weird one in our society. You're just, you're just dumb. Dead fish go downstream. Your theology should be making us go against the grain of what the world is pushing. So it's two sides and we're gonna go deeper in that. But again, theology should not be scary. It should be fun and it should be exciting. One of my favorite Authors now, he's actually an Episcopal priest, but he uh, also was a, he's a professional chef. And he writes this, I like a cook who smells, who smiles, <laughs> I like a cook who smiles out loud when he tastes his own work. Let God worry about your modesty. I wanna see your enthusiasm. Are we enthusiastic about the Lord? Are we excited about the Lord? So let me just say this, friends. These sermons that I give week after week are not gonna get you to Wednesday. If you're holding on for my sermons to fulfill your week, I hate to break it to you, they don't last me to Wednesday. This is a daily presence of Christ. This is a daily following of God. You need to own this for yourself. And so at Zootown Church, we're going to seek his presence. We're going to seek a better understanding. So at Zootown, we're not gonna just go deeper for information, we're gonna go deeper for revelation. For revelation. God is still speaking, God is talking. So Jesus gets to the tomb after he kind of gets rebuked by Mary and Martha and he stands there and it says, before he goes in the tomb, it says, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. He cared because death is the enemy. And my friends, 2020 has shown us death is the enemy. It is the main enemy in this world. And thank God Christ defeated death, defeated Satan, and took the keys to death in Hades. So the, one of the main things that we're gonna go is, I know there's so much fear, but everyone's so afraid of dying. Well, then you're not living. I love that scene in Shawshank Redemption. Get busy living or get busy dying. And he comes and he says, this is the enemy. But then he says, open the tomb. But you know what they said to him when he says, open the tomb? They questioned him. They said, it's been three days, Lord, and he stinketh. That's King James. He stinketh. Notice what they were doing with him. It was all negative all the time. Just cynicism and negativity. And this can't happen and this won't happen. And maybe someday it'll happen. And he's like, friends, it's happening right now. And my dear brothers and sisters, we can be so cynical. We can be so fearful. We can be so afraid. And we can doubt Christ's resurrection. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. My friends, this last year has been a year of death. But let me tell you, when all hope is lost is when Jesus steps in. And one thing we need to get uh, our minds wrapped around is many things have died 
There's been people at our church who their grandparents, their parents, families have died because of coronavirus. But my dear brothers and sisters, resurrection is not the end. We always think, I can't, when I die and resurrect, that's the end. It's the beginning. The resurrection is the beginning of all things, friends. So all these things that have been dying around us is gonna be resurrected to new life. Every spring, I can't wait for those tulips to come out. I don't know why God didn't make them last longer. You wait all year, <gasps> an hour, they're done, right? <laughs> Like, I love them though, because it's this sign of new life. All the things that have died this year, please believe me, all the things that have died this year, new life is coming. Be ready. And at Zootown Church, here's what people have said to us sometimes, because our church went through some serious stuff the last few years. But some people always say, if we have some great service or something like that, they always say to me, it feels like the old Zootown. I don't take that as a compliment. Because I'm here to tell you the old zoo town had some bad stuff sometimes. Had some division, had some strife. It's been like that for 11 years. You know why? Because it's a church. And you know why it's messy? Because there's people in it. Kind of like when people are like, only hypocrites go to church. And I'm like, yeah, you want to come in? We can use one more. There's a new thing for zoo town church. Let me tell you, zoo town church is better now. It's better because we can fly the way God has destined us for this town and destined us for this world. And our staff is this bunch of weird people who have different views and love each other. And we're focused on the goal of presenting Christ to this town. It is better now. So it's like the old zoo town. That's not a compliment. The new zoo town is better. Now, there has been many things that have died this year. Thank him. Thank him because that's where resurrection comes in for a new thing. Now look what happens. He unbinds Lazarus from the tomb and it says, many of the Jews therefore who had come with Mary had seen what he did, believed in him. Believe in the resurrection. That's the main theology I can tell you is believe that you cannot die. You will be raised again. But then it says, so from that day, they made plans to put him to death. Ah, people, this guy's amazing. Kill him! This guy has new ideas. Kill him! This guy's going against our normal life. Kill him! This guy's going against our view of religion. Kill him! This guy's fighting two political fronts, Rome and the Jews. Kill him! But why did they experience Christ? Because they saw it. And again, I can give you all the sermons. We can sing all the music. You need to see it for yourself and you need to believe this and feel it. But here's the deal. We live in a world, again, that is so afraid of offending everybody all the stinking time. Some people won't want this message. You love them and you move on. Your goal of coming to church every week, because we are actually the new garden. You have clothes on? You got clothes on, yeah. (laughs) We are the new garden. And we go out, be fruitful, multiply. We're building the spirit of God in here, go out. We come in here so they can experience Christ out there. My dear friends, we are an entitled nation. I'm a part of it, we're all a part of it. Everything's about us, but the church is meant to go out. We have to have a new season in Jesus. We're meant to go out. Now, a lot of you are like, okay, there's a lot of pressure. (laughs) So I gotta do it. Friends, chill out. Whatever job you have, whatever school you're at, whatever it is, that's where you're supposed to be. And let me say, if you have a family in here, your family is your mission field right now. Your family is your mission field. I love talking about Jesus with my kids. I got to go on a daddy-daughter date night last night for the first time in a long time. And my daughter is a woman now. And I'm not sad about it at all. (laughs) She looks so beautiful. And we're talking about mature things and I embarrassed her. It was just like everything a dad does. But me and my daughter love to talk about Jesus together and she's smart. So don't beat that too much pressure. Your family is where the excitement of the Lord comes. So may I say this friends, Missoula is hungry for the Lord, even if they don't know it. But all the sermons, all the music, all the knowledge, what they need is to experience Christ. They need to experience Christ. 
Our church has gone through some serious stuff this last year, or these last couple years. Let me guess, or let me tell you, we're not gonna be victims. We have enough victims in this world. Everyone's a victim about everything. We're not gonna be victims. We're gonna be champions and we're gonna move forward in Christ. Is there gonna be trials? Yes. But friends, it's time to roll away the stone from the old zoo town because the new zoo town is here. And that means we're gonna do things weird. That means we're gonna do things different. But the new zoo town is coming. My favorite theologians, Mumford and Sons, wrote this song. This is great. This is gospel, man. This is gospel. Roll away the stone is what it's called. The lyrics go, roll away your stone. I'll roll away mine. Together we can see what we will find. Don't leave me alone at this time, for I'm afraid of what I will discover inside. Because you told me that I would find a hole within the fragile substance of my soul. And I have filled this void with things unreal. And all the while, my character, it steals. Darkness is a harsh term, don't you think? And yet, and yet it dominates the things I see. It seems that all my bridges have been burnt, but you say that's exactly how this grace thing works. It's not the long walk home that will change this heart, but the welcome I receive with a restart. Friends, I know some of you had a really tough year. We all have. I know some of you are slipped into sin. I know some of you have got divorced. I know some of you are super struggling. The message of Jesus is restart. You are welcome here. You are loved here, but we're going in a new direction. At Zootown Church, my goal is to constantly unite. I'm amazed sometimes that I can post things online that are supposed to be uniting and then people just go and ruin it. But I love what one man writes about the church. He says, the kingdom of God does not demand that holy things be done, but that secular things be done sacramentally. At Zootown Church, we are not here to separate because we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. People call me soft gospel sometimes. You know why I'm not as harsh on the world? Because I've been a pastor for 12 years and I've seen as much dirt in the church as in the world, my friends. We are not going to separate these two. Our goal is to not go out there and be like, you're secular, we're sacred. We're gonna be like, you know what? We're here to restore this, that what you do matters, you are essential and your life is sacred. We're not the good guys, they're not the bad guys. We're all covered by the grace of Jesus Christ. And so our goal at Zootown is to show them sacramental things, the body and the blood of Christ, resurrection and all things. Let's pause and pray. Jesus, please have a new season where you roll away this stone. I know you're gonna, I don't even have to ask, you're doing it. Let us be focused, laser focused on what our true calling is. Let us be excited again about talking about the Lord. Let us be, just throw away that fear stuff every day. Throw it away and just be excited about the resurrection life we have in you. And I believe this in Jesus' name, amen. So roll away the stone. The second one is grab some new wine. Some of you are like, okay. What 2020 has proven is that we like predictability. We like normal. We always say, man, I just want to change. And now we're like, can we go back to normal? But what it's also proven is that we will give up our convictions for our comforts. We will give up our convictions for our comforts. And I see this scene where the religious people, and again, I'm gonna preach a whole series this this year on the Pharisees, because we all got some Pharisee in us. I have it in me. We're always like, those dumb Pharisees. It's in us too, friends. But we see this scene where these religious people, they were always following around Jesus. So if you wanna know if you're religious, you're always looking to point out something negative in someone's sermon or someone's life or someone's tweet or whatever. That shows you're a religious because you're always trying to find something on them. And so they're walking around and they're trying to find something on Jesus. And so they notice that his disciples, they're not doing the religious things of fasting. Why are they always eating and drinking all the time? Really, I think they were jealous of their freedom. And so they call them out. They're like, how come your guys are never doing all this religious stuff? Notice again, they're always worried about what everybody else is doing. And Jesus says to him, he says, and who pours new wine into an old wineskin? If someone did, the old wineskin would burst and the new wine would be lost. New wine must always be poured into new wineskins. Yet you say the old ways are better and you refuse to even taste the new thing that I bring. Again, we, we, we love our comfort. We love nor- normal normalcy or whatever it's called. I think that's a word, right? Normalcy. But then we always are like, I want to feel God. I, I, want, I want God to, to do something new. He's like, I am. It's are we open to it and are we listening to it? 
And so I'll just tell you straight up, like, I think old traditions are great. I really do. I read the early church fathers. I post the early church fathers' prayers all the time. This isn't a knock on things you hold sacred, but it's also saying that there are new things that Christ is still speaking in 2021. So again, I don't do this very much anymore. I used to do it all the time, but I know it's like my heart is completely different in this. But yeah, as a church, we get letters all the time, some good, some bad. And a couple, about a month ago, we got a letter, of course, unsigned, and it was telling us basically our music sucks and we need to play the music they like. You're not the only one in here. They want us to play songs that they know, as if we know what songs they know. Let me tell you something. I'm a hip hop fan, love hip hop. 90s hip hop, the best. No one will ever change my mind. I don't like new hip hop. They're just mumbling, just I'm like, what's he saying? At least Eminem, I could understand the swear word he was saying, but now, like, right? But if someone likes new rap, I'm like, cool, man, that's your thing, that's great. So it's Zootown, right? We get this letter and I'm like, look, I trust Dan that he's praying in the spirit to, t- to know what songs to play this Sunday. I trust him. Now, do I like old gospel, old gospel music? Yeah, I do. But I trust him. So you get a letter like that, right? You, you get a letter where it's like, just do the old. But then you get a letter like this. Merry Christmas, Zootown Church. Thank you for blessing our lives by bringing the word to us each week through Scott's awesome messages. Jenny's support, Ty and Dan and the crew's beautiful music, Chad's ingenuous creativity, Pete and Dolph's devotion to the kids, Carly's productions, and Susanna's ability to organize it all. Love you guys, Scott and Marsha Bloom. Anyways. Don't you see? Come on, man. He's like, we got some new wine. We got some new things. We're always moving forward. So what this really is, is this, you know, they would put wine in a bladder, basically like a goat bladder, and you could only use it once because it would get old, it would get crusty, and it would dry out, and once the the wine fermented, it would expand, and it would crack through and break. So again, traditions are good, but Jesus has a new spirit for us. Now, going back to theology, all the theology I'm sharing with you isn't new, it's old. It's just the American church has left a bunch of it out. Well, now we know. We study the early church fathers. It's not new. It's old. This is good stuff. But I'm here to tell you, Zootown's going to mix it up a little bit. We're going to mix it up because we want God's presence. We want God to move. And what we tell God every Sunday is, you got one hour, Jesus. You better show up. Come on. When are the Packers playing? That's cool. If you want to stay and watch the game, watch the game. I'm not going to shame you for it. But we basically tell God, You got one hour, because some of you want to get in, do your communion, hear the message, get out. Get in, hear the communion, do it, get out. Come on, right? And then we're like, why didn't God show up? He's always here, by the way. But what if God's like, hmm, at 1215 is when I was really going to bring the heat. So what we're going to do is we're going to change things up. We're going to be, you might show up one Sunday. We might just have one service on one Sunday, and we're going to let God do his thing. Sometimes he's going he's to be like, Scott, you preach for 20 minutes and that's it. Now, some of you are like, amen, God, bring it on. But we're going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to seek the presence of God. We're going to be a weird church. We're going to talk about the gifts. We're going to talk about this stuff because it's all in the scriptures and too. It's like, it's God, man, it's God. If I can sit at home and play Call of Duty Cold War, which is awesome, I'm killing it for two hours. I can sit here and wait for the presence of God. We can pray with each other. We can take communion. So we're going to mix it up. We're going to do different things. That's not going to be conducive to your schedule or mine or anybody else's. It's what God is leading us to do because we're here to obey God. Here's the real context of this though. He's really talking about religion. He's saying you have this old skin and it's all your works, it's all your goodness, it's all your giving, it's all this stuff. And, it's, and it, what it does, is it creates this self-righteousness in us and this judgment. And we're trying to hold it in this new thing called grace. We don't like grace. We like justice. We are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if we're, he's doing a new thing in us, it's a, a, a new thing, a new spirit of grace and mercy. And all our religion, all our self-righteousness, all our pride, all those things can't fit in that new skin. It can't. It's all the grace of God. It's all Jesus's grace. So let me say this again. 
We are being trained. I'm gonna talk so much this year about renewing our mind. Paul talked more about renewing our mind and our spirit than not sinning. And we are being trained by mainstream media, politicians, social media to think we're better than people. And that if you vote this way, you're on this side and you're better. And if, cause we're the side that's given to the poor and we're the side that's this. They're training us to think we're better than each other or more righteous than each other. Listen to how Jesus said, he says, refuse to be a critic full of bias towards others and judgment will not be passed on you. For you'll be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement you use on them will be used on you. Now, I actually think he's talking about other people, not necessarily God. Who wants to judge a person who's not judgmental? You're like, oh, he's kind of cool, right? He's nice. Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypercritical and a hypocrite. First, acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. Jesus loves the same people that I hate. He just does. And we, as a society, we have allowed, again, the world to dictate the church. And we are cynical, we are negative, and we're judgmental. So here's my New Year's challenge to you. I'm a challenger. Just because you you can say truth, it's just kind of the way you say it too. So this isn't saying you don't ever talk about things that are wrong. It's the way you do it. And check in your own heart before you do it. So here's my challenge, because here's what I've done. There's a lot of guys that I follow, and I appreciate their theology on a lot of things, but I've realized they're just cynics. They're always bashing the church. So if you're following people online, and they're always bashing the church, and they're always victims, and there's always something wrong, unfollow them, because it's not helping you. And if you are that person, take a look in the mirror, because we all got our own stuff. We're gonna be a church that's not gonna live in victimhood. We're not gonna live in cynicism. This is God's bride. You are God's church. And if we're constantly knocking it, we're kind of punching Jesus' wife. You want me to say that again? Okay, I won't. Someone hits my wife, they're in trouble. So how about a year of something else? No, yes, will you be hurt by church? Yes, we all are hurt by church. Why? It's filled with people. I've been hurt by church. You've been hurt by church. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but you've hurt at work. I mean, whatever it is, right? We've hurt people. The church is messy and I'm gonna challenge. I am a challenger, but we're not gonna live in victimhood and cynicism. We have to shine bright to this culture and that is living in negativity. So let's pray for our blind spots in our own life. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our judgment. Forgive us our self-righteousness. Show us our blind spots and give us a new year of energy and excitement, not cynicism and negativity and despair. Through the resurrection life, amen. So roll away our stone, grab some new wine, now help a brother out. This isn't a Christian term. Everyone knows this term. It's the term good Samaritan. The problem is, is this gets misused all the time. It's not just about saving someone from a fire. That's great. That's awesome. But there's a lot to this story. So I'll just kind of break it down real quick. There's this man, he was on a road um, and he got beat up and he got left for dead. And Jesus tells this parable in Luke 10. And it says, these two guys walked by first. One was a priest. And it says, the priest walked around him. The second one was a Levite. He was like, they were the most pure ones. They didn't drink alcohol. They didn't cut their hair. I mean, John the Baptist was a Levite. And it says he walked around him. Now, the interesting part is if you look at the geography where the road he's talking about, it was a, there was walls. He had to climb the wall to get around this guy who was beat up and hurt and dying. And then Jesus says, so again, that's the point. The religious ones, the churchgoers, the theologians walked by. And Luke 10, he says, finally, another man. A Samaritan came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. He stooped down and gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. Lifting him up, he placed him on his donkey and brought him to an inn. Then he took him from his donkey and carried him to a room for the night. 
The next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with, his, with these words, take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. So now tell me, which one of these three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbor? The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. And Jesus said, you must go and do the same as he. This was a Samaritan who didn't even really worship the same God. He had terrible theology. They were looked at as like half breeds. And like, you know, they, they, the Jews hated them. They thought they were these dogs. And Jesus makes a point to say, basically, like this Muslim dude took care of him when y'all walked around. It's a huge story here. Huge story. This man was honored by Jesus, but he says, You must go do the same. Now, here's the one thing people always leave out that guy had a job, and that guy had money, and it cost him something. It cost him money. He was generous. And here's the thing. The one thing I really always struggle with, because we're being trained to do it, everyone's always so worried about what everybody else is spending their money on and how they're helping the poor. Do you see once Jesus say, don't worry, the government's going to take care of it? Not once. And here we are fighting, 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 fighting. And again, they're like, if you, give, if you vote for us, we're going to take care of the poor. I don't think we get treasures in heaven for that, by the way. You have to pay that tax. Jesus said, you worry about your money and your generosity. Crickets, 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 crickets. I do believe that your, our spiritual growth is connected to money. Not all money, but Jesus talked about it a lot because he said, you cannot serve God in money. You can't, it's impossible. And there's a reason that there's this tension with us with that. But what are you gonna do with your money, your generosity? I never talk about money at this church. I talk about Jesus. We don't pass a plate or nothing. But I love another theologian, Denzel Washington said this. He said, if you're gonna pray for rain, you gotta deal with the mud. If you're gonna pray for rain, you have to deal with the mud. Meaning we always think there's gonna be this glorious season where money doesn't matter or we don't have a bill or whatever. That's never going to happen. And so what we tell ourselves is we'll be generous when that season happens. Well, there's mud there too, friends. There's mud there too. Start now. I always tell you, you're not giving to us, you're giving through us. We give a ton of money away. Last year, we gave $2,500 to Missoula Boxing Club. It's a great, great organization. It's giving the kids an outlet. It's giving the kids, and I think that generation needs to toughen up in a little bit, all right? I'm getting older, okay? They need to toughen up. We gave to that. We give to missionaries around the world. We give every month to Union Gospel Mission. What are you doing with your money? And again, I'm not here to shame you. I don't know. I have never looked at our books once in 11 years of who gives. Not once. What are you doing with your money? It's always, we got these politicians fighting about our money. Look at the stimulus bill. Why do we care what these people are think? Seriously, look at what they did. And we're fighting over them? Come on. We need to get to the point of personal responsibility. Where are you being generous? Now, again, I am so proud of this church. We raised $10,000 on Christmas Eve to give to the Jaden Fred Foundation and Death to Life. Congratulations. $10,000. We gave 100% of that money away. I am proud of this church, but I'm telling you we can do better. If you've been going to this church forever and you're not giving anything, why? I'm just telling you, man, it matters. Your finances matter with Jesus. He says it right here. It costs you something, but it frees you of it too. Don't end. So let me be clear. Don't ever be ashamed of making money. Stop listening to the world that's just trying to shame you all the time for how much money you have or what you do. And don't be doing that to other people. You wanna go buy a new car? Go buy a new car. You want to buy a house? Buy a house. That's between you and God. But don't sit on your money either. There's not another season. And so just in full transparency, we have an odd budget. 
it's split 50-50. Basically, 50% of it is just monthly giving. And then the other 50% is just these big gifts that we give from people. So there's like a few people who are carrying this whole church. We can do a lot of good this year. And we can build that kids in the zoo this year. We can do it. Think about it. If everyone just gave $100 a month, it would change the landscape of this church. And it's not a one-time thing. That's why I just have it in my budget. I've never, ever ever been sorry that I've been generous. You ever see people who are generous who are like mean people? It does something. So get with God and you decide. Again, I'm just telling you what he said. He goes, you go and do likewise. Stop worrying about what Congress is telling you to spend your money on or all this stuff. What are you spending your money on? And if you don't trust me, because there's a lot of churches who've used money bad, then give it to something else. It's about you. It's about you taking God's blessings and blessing other people with it. So let me end with this. Roll away the stone, grab some new wine and help a brother out. Again, in full transparency, I have, I come, the last four years, I completely deconstructed my faith. There were things that just weren't making sense. And I saw some holes in the church and the way things were doing. I mean, the big C church, but I hate that term deconstruction. <laughs> I, can, I like to call it remodel, remodel. Because Jesus is our cornerstone at Zootown Church. It will always be our cornerstone. But there's some boards that go up sometimes that you need to tear down, but you don't leave an empty wall, you put another board up. And I have, the, the problem I've seen with a lot of Christians who just bash the church and they're wounded by the church and it's just constant victimhood, just constant victimhood. You watch them now and it's like they've left the church and they're upset, but what are they doing? What are they doing? Just judging people online and they're upset and they're just like, it's everyone else's fault. Don't go into deconstruction in the sense that like when we talk about theology and that stuff, it's okay to challenge ideas. But remodel, a part of new growth and change is re model. So we're not going to give into cynicism either. But if you remember, if you were here about four years ago, I sat, the stage was over there. I sat there with a cup of coffee and I said, the Lord is going to prune this church. He told me and boy, did he, I thought he was going to prune you. I didn't know he was going to prune me. Because there's that verse in John 14 where it says, I prune the vines, the vine dresser prunes the vine so more growth can happen. He pruned us. Now more growth is going to happen. We are there, we're in it. But let me say this, I've said it so much that there's a reformation happening in the world. He's gonna prune the big C church. You are watching pastor after pastor fall in certain areas. You know why? You were never meant to worship a pastor, ever. I'm a sinful human being and I'm wrong about things. So why don't you show me grace and I'll show you grace, okay? It's not here to worship or nitpick everything I'm doing or whatever those pastors are doing, but a lot of those pastors have used the church to elevate their own platform. That's not me, that's not us. I'm here to introduce you to Jesus every week. You find your own faith. You listen to Jesus yourself because I am co-equals with you in this thing, but we're in it. We are in the Reformation. And so here's where we're at at Zootown, okay? Where I'm at, I am not a right-wing conservative evangelical Christian. I'm just not, because I have seen a lot of power and manipulation and weird stuff with that. But I still glean from a lot of that. It wasn't all bad. I'm not gonna be a cynic. And I see a lot of shame. They're, they become Sometimes they become super religious, it's always the homosexual's fault. It's always abortion's fault. It's everyone's fault, right? Come on, that's not good either. But I'm also, I see, I, I'm concerned for the progressive Christian church now. I'm not that either because everything is now social justice. Everything is social justice. And my problem with the progressive church, they never talk about sin. Yes, Jesus cares about racism. It's not the only thing he talked about. He talked a lot about sin. We have this entire book that tells us. And so we're not that either. We're in the middle. We're in the middle. And we're gonna preach Jesus. We're gonna preach Jesus. We're gonna preach Jesus. 
but it doesn't mean we're not convicted about certain things. And there's this new season where we're gonna talk about other stuff too. And what's happened is, is a lot of the churches have given in. We've allowed, okay, this is where I'm gonna get real serious. Real serious, so check your hearts. We've allowed society to tell us what we can and can't say and what we can and can't do. Now, let me be clear. Society is not my enemy. People aren't our enemy. The battle is not against flesh and blood, but the spiritual powers of the world. There's a spiritual fight going on in the world right now. And we've allowed the media, because the media says we need to talk about racism, so that's all we can talk about now. But we can't talk about sexual stuff, can we? There's so much of that in this book. We can't talk about other sins, because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody and all this stuff. Friends, we need to get back to this. Because what we're saying is these apostles were a bunch of idiots and we're smarter than them. We're not. This is a book that gives us the history of mankind. And if we don't learn from it, we repeat it. So we need to break away from society telling us what we can and can't say and can and can't do just because we're afraid of offending somebody. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's where I'm at. I believe in the forgiveness of all men. When it was finished on the cross, he says it is finished. It's done. It's over. I don't care where you're at in your journey. God says it is finished and it is done. Now, the, the, the thing you do is believe the good news. I believe that. But I made a post. Again, just please hear me out on this. Because we have to start thinking higher. We have to renew our minds. I made a post yesterday. This is a really weird deal. Everyone thinks this is politics. It's not politics. Here's what politicians have done. They, when they want something political passed, they call it moral. When they want something moral passed, they call it political. It's just a political issue. No, it's not. It's a moral issue. And Jesus definitely was fighting politics. The Sanhedrin was the politics of the world. Now, again, these politicians are not my enemy. That's not what I'm talking about. But there is something that they're doing to sway us. I just posted online yesterday, and I rarely post on this stuff, that in the 117th Congress, Nancy Pelosi has taken out the words man, he, she, mother, father, gender. They're not going to be allowed to say it in Senate. So ask yourself, why are these people so obsessed with sex? Why are they so obsessed? Why are, what does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with anything? And we just spent years saying, like, we're going to stand up for women. We should. How do you stand up for women if we can't call them women? This church stands up for women. We let women preachers. We have women on our board. We stand up for them. How can we stand up? So here's my thing. Why are we listening to these people? Why are we letting them dictate how we think and act towards each other? But then there's some things we're like, well, we can't talk about that. Yes, we can. Jesus demands we talk about some of this stuff. But why? Because he loves people. And if we don't start talking about some of these things, it's not political. It's not political. They've done a great job at dividing the body of Christ. This is following Jesus over man. This is following Jesus over the other spiritual realms of this world. Friends, it's time we renew our minds at Zootown Church. It's time we renew our minds as a people. We're being manipulated. We're being lied to. Renew your mind, friends, in this new year. So here's the deal. I'm 39. I'm looking fabulous at 39. But I got like 20 years of good ministry left, like real good ministry. And I'm not going to bend to man. <laughs> and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. And at Zootown Church, we're going to go for it. We're not going to play the game that they're trying to get us to play. We're going to go for it. And if you know me, you know me. I'm grace, 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 great. I don't care if you're transgender. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care about any of that. If you come in here, I will give you a hug. <laughs> and I will welcome you to the table of Christ. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a Democrat. You are welcome in the kingdom of God. You are accepted. You are loved. But we're going to go for it, and we're going to talk about things that really matter and that are, that we're going to go against the stream. We're going to. And I'm going to. And we have seen amazing things at this church, amazing things. And we're going to see more, and we're going to go for it. And so I want you to invite you to be a part of this. I want to, be, I want to invite you to stop letting this, this, this stuff divide us. And it's going to be messy, and it's going to be sinful. But what we do in here is essential because it's eternal. It's eternal. And so we're rolling away the stone. We're going to drink some new wine. We're going to help our brother out. 
And again, this doesn't negate grace. Telling people the truth is grace. If I see my kid walking up to the, a fire and he's going to put his hand in it, which he's done many times, if I was like, oh man, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Come on. Stop this. Let's think like Christ. Let's obey what he's told us in here. And let's renew our minds this year for what's coming. 2020 has brought a lot of evil and a lot of suffering, and people wonder what God's plan is. Band, you can come up, by the way. And one man writes this, evil does not flow from a first domino that God himself toppled. Rather, evil is the perversion of God's good gift of free will. It arises from the choices made by imperfect imagers, not from God's prompting or predestination. He's not a puppet master pulling the strings. God does not need evil, but he has the power to take the evil that flows from free will decisions, human or otherwise, and use it to produce good in his glory through the obedience of his loyal imagers who are his hands and feet on the ground now. All of this means that what we choose to do is an important part of how things will turn out. What we do matters. God has decreed the ends to which all things will come. And as believers, we are prompted by his spirit to be the good means to those decreed ends. We are the image bearers of Christ. We are the light of the world. Jesus told us that. And it's time we start walking in that. I'm going to walk in that. We are going to walk in that. And we are gonna strip some of these things away that don't matter. And we're gonna be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And people might not like us, just like some of them came to Jesus. Some of them wanted to kill him. But when I stand before God, I wanna know my good and faithful servant is what I wanna be said to me. Not, man, some people got upset with you on Twitter. I'm not even on Twitter, by the way. It's time, friends. It's time to renew our minds. So here's what I want you to pray this week. And I'm gonna pray with you in a minute. Paul talked so much about the mind and we are being so persuaded by earthly things. So this week, write it down, Romans 12, two. I'd love you to pray this every day because I believe in this next month, there's gonna be stuff happening. I don't, I'm not making any predictions, but there's something happening. And he says, stop intimidating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. Stop intimidating or imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Friends, stand up. I'm going to pray for us. New big things are on the way. A spiritual revival is on the way. And we are a grace-centered church. We are always going to preach the grace and the acceptance and the love of God. But we're going to obey God and what he tells us to do. And if you are open to that, I pray that you tell them that you're open to that. And that you say, there's a new season here. Jesus, I pray for your people. I am an under shepherd, you are the shepherd. Bless your people with a new vision, a new heart. Speak to us, speak to us, Lord. Take away this wall of cynicism and negativity that is put on us by the media in the world and our own evil hearts. Break it down, Lord. Renew our minds to what is true and what is good. Renew our minds to the hope of the resurrection. Renew our minds to the spirit that is working within us. And unite us, Father. Unite us, Father, for a common goal of sharing your love and your forgiveness with all of humanity. Let us be bold. I pray for a spirit of boldness over your people. that even if everyone leaves us, you have not. I pray for a spirit of generosity over this church, 
that it's only a work that you can do, that we are break, broken from the bondage of money. And I pray that your grace and your love just shines forth to a weary city in a weary world. Heal our hearts, heal our minds, heal our souls. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.